loving us so much. You are so, so very good to us. So as we continue now, as we get to hear your word, Father, we just um, ask again for hearts to receive, feet to walk it out. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Everyone, nice to see your smiling faces, believe it or not. So how are we doing? Another day closer to going home? Uh, if you came here today without a Bible and you'd like to follow along, uh, if you raise your hand, if you don't have one, we'll give you one. You can follow along. If you like it, you can keep it. It's uh, our gift to you. So, and it's free. Everybody likes free things, right? So we will be continuing in Matthew. Uh, we will be picking up from where we left off last week, which is verse 18 of chapter 1. And as we uh, saw last week, uh, we saw a bunch of genealogies. So if you, if you came here for the first time last week and you, and you heard, oh, I went to church and all I got was genealogies, you saw that it was, it was much more different than just the names, wasn't it? We saw that there were, in, in Matthew's uh, gospel, that there were um, basically five women uh, one of them who wanted to be a prostitute or pretended to be a prostitute, right? And then you had another one who was a prostitute. You had another one who was a Moabitess who was, that, um, <coughs> that line was, uh, was basically cursed for 10 generations. Um, you had uh, Mary, who would be the mother of Jesus, who you know, wasn't married, and she was pregnant. So what a lineage, what a lineage of Jesus Christ. But see, this is Paul's, or I'm sorry, this is Matthew's purpose, is to show us, and there was no question back in them day, when Paul, or gee whiz, when Matthew laid this, when Matthew laid this out for, uh, for the Jews, and he said to them, so-and-so begat so-and-so who begat so-and-so. And then he named these women. One of them uh, was, was Tamar, which was uh, the daughter-in-law of Judah. A couple of, and she, uh, she pretended to be a prostitute. Then, then we had another one uh, that was uh, Rahab, who was a prostitute. Now, it's kind of interesting because... Rahab, and we're in Joshua on Wednesday nights. We just started chapter one. And Rahab, if you remember, she's the one that uh, the spies came and she hid them. And it was kind of interesting because, you know, she flat out lied to the people who came and asked her. But the thing, but the thing was, is you look, go back and you look in Hebrews chapter 11 and her name is right there in the hall of faith. Why? Because she believed in God. Now, obviously, God doesn't condone anybody lying, but she believed. So, and he went on, and, and uh, uh, then you had Ruth as well. Um, you had basically Bathsheba, but it said the wife of Uriah which was Bathsheba. If you remember, that is the one who uh, David, when he was supposed to be out to war, and he looked over the wall, and he wasn't out to war. He was hanging out in the castle, and he looked over the wall, and he sees this woman. And, you know, he ends up taking her, and then he realized what he did, and, and uh, she gets pregnant. So then he's got to get Uriah, who's her husband, to come back because he's out battling. He's defending the nation. And he gets Uriah to come back and tries to get him drunk so that he would sleep with his wife so they could say, oh, no, it's yours. But it didn't work out. Uriah was too honorable and didn't do it. So after a couple of tries, David decided, hey, you know, Joab, come here. Take Uriah and put him on the front line. 
and then sound the attack and let's go attack them. And then as soon as he gets up to the front, everybody leave. And he would get killed. So uh, you have Bathsheba and then you come to Mary. And it's kind of interesting because as Matthew gives the origin, the genealogy of the king, the son of David, because that's what he was. But also the seed of Abraham, because he was the Messiah, the one that would save his people. So, and we discussed how Luke's gospel is just a little bit different in the genealogy. He goes, uh, Matthew ha does it in a series of 14s. There's not as many. There's some that he left out. He also goes through the lineage of Solomon. So passes from David, King David, down to Solomon, and so on and so forth. And where Luke didn't do that, it was, it was David's next son, Nathan, that the line came through. So a little bit of difference, but the same it's just Matthew chose to leave some of them out. So that's where we left out last week. Now, it's interesting because Matthew was one of the first writers. It could have been Mark or Matthew, but uh, nobody disputed. The Jews did not dispute what Matthew was saying as far as the genealogy went. So we come here this morning and we pick up in verse 18 and it says this. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Now a couple of things as we read um, this verse, it says now the birth or the origin of Jesus Christ. The origin, where did he come from? Okay was as follows. This is how it went. His mother, Mary, was betrothed to Joseph. Now, it's interesting because back in them days, a lot of times, hey, you know, my friend lives next door and he has a daughter and I have a son. And, you know, when they get to be 20 years old or 18 years old or 16 years old, whatever. And a lot of times there could be a lot of difference in the age. And there was here with Mary and Joseph. Um, a lot of times that um, they say, hey, they're going to get married. And this is going to be the husband. And, and sometimes in them days, they didn't even know the person. Didn't even know the person. Maybe they seen him, but maybe they never talked to him. A lot of times the parents kept it quiet because they didn't want them to know. But they would be betrothed to one another, or they would be espoused. Now, in this period of time and this betrothal, uh, you were considered basically married, but you didn't live together, and you couldn't do anything together. You had to have a chaperone wherever you went. But if you didn't like that person or you wanted to not marry that person, if they both agreed, then they would write a bill of divorcement. Very interesting, isn't it? You're engaged. You can't get out of it. That's basically what it would be. It was usually for a year period of time. And in that year period of time, the husband-to-be, you know what his job would be? <clears throat> to go and build an addition onto his father's house because after they were married they would ha live at his father's house in that room addition. Interesting, isn't it? But see, it, it becomes even more interesting than that. See, they had to be chaperoned. They couldn't really do anything together. But after he built this addition, after the year's time had passed, now, he was hers and she was his. Only a divorce could get them separated from one another so that they could be with somebody else. But after he would build this addition and the year's time was up, you remember their days started when? At night, 
right? The next day started when two stars were in the sky, all right? So it was usually an I, at night, maybe an hour before sundown. Um, and so whenever that period of time would come, and the, and the groom did not have to tell his bride when he was coming. So her and her bridesmaids would stay there at her house with their lamps always ready for when the groom came. Is this starting to sound familiar? Interesting. So then here comes the groom and his friends, and they would get to the house and they would blow the trumpet Getting to sound a little bit more familiar? They would blow this trumpet and they would enter the house. And the groom would take his bride and take her home to his house. The addition that was built. Now he could come at any time after that year was up. He could come six months. He could come that day. It didn't really matter. But see, he would come and he would take his bride and he would take her to his house, home. Does that sound familiar? Does it sound like the trumpet's going to blow and Jesus is going to come and he's going to take us home to his house? Interesting. Isn't it interesting how the scripture interprets itself? how we look at this and we see uh, the groom coming, the lamps to be full of oil, because you never knew when he was going to come. Sounds like us, doesn't it? We don't know when our groom is coming, do we? But here we sit at our house ready to go, ready to go. And one day, and we don't know when, Jesus is going to come, and we're going to hear what? The trumpets. The trumpet's going to be blown, and he's going to come, and he's going to take us home. Now, it's been a couple thousand years. Jesus said, you know, uh, where I go, you will be, and I go to prepare a what? A place for you. So Joseph, for this year, and he was a carpenter, has been making a room addition. Jesus, who is a carpenter, has been making a room addition for 2,000 years. Wow, what's that going to look like? 2,000 years. I mean, he, you know, he built what you see in six days. He wants it to be perfect, doesn't he? Just like Joseph probably making this, and oh, this, this door handle has to be just perfect. This trim has to be exquisite. Maybe she'll love me. Because if you remember, it wasn't, they didn't get married because of love. They were espoused to each other. Oh, and, and, and look at the floor. The floor is going to be perfect. And, and, and I don't want her to walk through on her bare feet and get splinters. And I wonder if she's going to love me because of all my hard work. And see, it's a great picture for us to look at, to see Jesus leaving. He left us with this picture, but just Jesus leaving to go home to add on to his father's house for you, for me. How much love does that take? It takes a lot, doesn't it? But see, now the birth of Jesus was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Now I want you to turn over to, because there's, there's a lot we can add to this. So let's turn to Luke chapter 1. And we're going to pick up in verse 26.
Luke 1.26. Now, just to kind of give you a little bit of a background, uh, Zacharias um, was married to a, Larry, a, a woman named Elizabeth, and um, she was barren, never had a child. They were both old in age, but the angel Gabriel came and talked with uh, Zacharias and told him that his wife was going to be pregnant. They were going to name the son John. And so as we pick up in verse 26, it says, Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Okay? So to a virgin, now it's kind of interesting, um, Luke says right off the bat, virgin. Matthew's going to say virgin. When the Septuagint was written, they took the word Alma in the Hebrew, which means virgin and young lady, and they translated it, take a guess what? Virgin. Okay? Nobody was complaining Nobody had any agenda to, oh, well, this can't be virgin because how could it be a virgin if she has a baby? Well, nobody was complaining when they translated it. Nobody complained until when? Until Jesus came on the scene. And then only the leadership complained because they didn't want to accept him. So to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, the virgin's name was Mary, and having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you, blessed are you among women. Now, this is kind of interesting because this word that says here, highly favored, means somebody with a specific honor, somebody that was accepted. Okay, it's used only one other time in the New Testament. It's in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6. And you don't have to turn there if you don't want to, if you don't want to lose your place. But 1 6 says this To the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made who? Us. Us, the church. He made us what? Accepted in the beloved. It's the same word, highly favored and accepted. The only two times it's used in the New Testament. So he's saying here, <clears throat> rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Women. Now she was. Now it's, it's a shame that, uh, and we kind of touched on this a little bit last week, but it's a shame that um, some religions have taken her and stuck her on the back of the cross as a co-redemptive as Jesus. That's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. The scripture does not teach that. Where do we get this from? But it's a shame because most, you know, the Catholics, they basically brutalize her for doing that. And, and most, uh, you know, other churches take Mary and they look down on her because this is the way the Catholics look at her. It's a shame. It really is. Think about this. You're 14 or 15 years old. If you have sex outside of marriage and you get pregnant, what's the punishment? Stoning. Death. That's it. Period. Here you have this 14 or 15 year old girl who's going to probably marry this 25 to 30 year old guy. And she's going to end up getting pregnant. How do you deal with that? How would you deal with that? Okay, so uh, let me see here. I could get stoned and get killed. I didn't even do anything. Do you think she was a stand up gal? Brave tough. And she had to be. And I can just imagine 
I can just imagine how she feels when, you know, she gets that co-redemptive lab, uh, label put on her. And people don't like her because, oh, well, that Mary, you know, look at what she did. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine having to go through that? Makes you think some of the things you're going through are not so bad anyway, are they? Maybe. Verse 29, but when he saw, when she saw him, this would be the angel, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting was this. So what the heck are you talking about? Mary, what? Huh? She was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, do not be afraid. Every time we see that, we should probably think she was probably afraid. I would be. Okay, I'm going to get stoned. Well, now that we're on this side of uh, the cross, you get stoned, you go to heaven. You know, right? Breakfast with Jesus. Bacon. Every day. It won't even affect you. It won't make you fat. It won't clog your arteries. It's just good. Good for you. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. Comforting, you will conceive, right, in your womb, and you'll bring forth a son, and you're going to call his name Jesus. He will be great. And we, that's an understatement, isn't it? He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Forever with no end. Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be, since I do not know a man? So she's, there's another claim. She's a virgin. She's a virgin. And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Overshadow you. Therefore also, that what? That holy one. In the King James, it says holy thing. Who is to be born will be called what? The what? The holy one that's born from her will be called the son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, also has conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her, for her who is called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Now, who believes that? Do we believe that? Nothing is impossible? We should believe that. How do you take this? Look at, look at Abram and Sarai, or Abraham and Sarah. How old were they? They were old. They were way past over the hill. He was, what, 100 and she was 90? Okay. Anybody in here had? Nobody's that old, so nobody could say yes, but anybody ever hear of anything like that? I have. It's right here. Right? Now you have these two that are well up there in age, and they have a baby. Well, for with God, nothing is impossible. And that means for you too. That means no, no matter how dark it gets, no, no matter how bleak it gets, no matter how much you don't know what to do, no matter how much you've been praying, there's nothing impossible for him to do. Is there? And sometimes he makes us wait. That's the hardest part, isn't it? Okay, God, I know you're going to do this, but when? 
Well, not today. Ah, oh, come on. When? Just wait. Do you trust me? Do you have enough faith in me that this is going to work out? Because nothing is impossible. But sometimes we look at it that way, don't we? Nothing is impossible. I know people here that are, you know, are got to notice they got to leave their house that they've been there for years. Well, look at the housing market. I mean, are you serious? But this is the way of the world today. I know people here don't have jobs. And it's hard because, you know, you as men know how difficult that is, your responsibility to take care of your family. Of course, the Lord does it through you, but it's difficult. What do I do? Where do I go? And you, and you start getting down, and your, your eye goes off the Lord. And he's saying, wait a minute, nothing's impossible. Everything's, I can do it all. I can give you a job like that. But we're going to wait a little bit because I'm going to build your faith. Because right around the corner, something is coming. And I need you to stand strong. And this is what he, or maybe it's just a sickness, an illness. Maybe you have cancer or something else. It's not impossible. God said it. It's not impossible. And it's not impossible for us. And we need to remember that. We need to not be afraid. Verse 35, And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative... Your relative has conceived a son in her old age, and now this, now the sixth month for her who was called barren, for with God nothing is impossible. Then Mary said, Behold, the maid servant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Now, do you think she's scared? Okay, I'm going to be pregnant. How am I going to explain this? How am I going to tell Joseph? How am I going to tell my parents? What am I going to do? Well, I'm going to head over to Elizabeth's house. She's going to have a baby. And this is her sixth month, right? I can't, I can't fathom being in this position that she's in. And it says this in verse 39. Now Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste to a city of Judah. I'd be running too. I'd get over there as quick as I can. And entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. The babe being who? John the Baptist, right? John the Baptizer. He wasn't a Baptist. No matter what they tell you, he wasn't a Baptist, okay? So we're going to call him John the Baptizer because that's what he did, right? <clears throat> but see, the babe what? John leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Just at the word, the voice of Mary. Then she spoke out with a loud voice and said, blessed are you among woman, women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. If you're an ex-Catholic, you know that saying over and over and over again in your head, don't you? But why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Wow. That's what Elizabeth just said. Why is this granted to me? That the mother of the Lord, God himself, in her womb would come to me. Why? Because she was humble, wasn't she? She was a good woman, wasn't she? And obviously she trusted and believed in the Lord. 
For indeed, as soon as my voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe, John, leaped in my womb for joy. Blessed is she who believed, for there will be fulfillment of those things which were told her by, from the Lord. So turn back with me to Matthew to, to give you a better insight of something that Matthew doesn't say here. And we'll pick up in verse 19. So here we have Mary's pregnant. She goes to visit, finds out that her cousin is pregnant. She's pregnant. She probably told her. They're probably like, oh, whoa, what are we going to do? Now she comes back. So at the birth of John, she comes back. Now maybe she's starting to show, and she's got to go tell Joseph. How hard do you think that would be? And some of you might have experienced that. How difficult was that? How hard would that be? Penalty is death. What's Joseph going to think of her? You cheated on me. I'm going to tell everybody, you're going to be ridiculed. You're going to be stoned. There's no way out for you. But that's not what happened, is it? Because it says here in verse 19, Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. Yes, he's an honorable man. He's a just man. He didn't want to make a big deal out of it. Just separate from one another. He doesn't know what's going on. You know, Mary might have told him, and he's like, uh, yeah, okay, sure. Yeah, okay, nice, nice try, nice try. Can we try something else? How about maybe, I don't know. So there was this angel, and he came, and he said, what now? Come on, Really? But he was a just man and not wanting to make her a public example was minded to put her away secretly. Verse 20. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. So the angel comes in and here's, here's Joseph thinking, what do I do? You know, how do I put her away? What, what am I going to do in this situation? And the angel comes. Now it's interesting because five times, five times an angel comes and speaks to Joseph. And as we go through Matthew, uh, we're going to see him. And for different reasons... But see, here you have this girl named Mary, this young teenager named Mary, a stand-up gal. And you have this guy named Joseph who is probably maybe 30 years old. And a stand-up guy, because he didn't want to make a public spectacle of Mary. And as he pondered on these things, the angel comes and puts him to comfort. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. It's okay. Yes, Mary was telling the truth. This is what happened. Do we see how God's hand works? Go back to Adam. The genealogy starting, well, in Luke, it started at Jesus and went to Adam. Matthew went the other way. But here, you have Adam who falls and sins. What does God do? Gives a way out. Shows it to him right there on, uh, by slaying the animal so that they could be covered. Tells Mary what? Your seed. Well, women don't have seeds. How's that possible? But see, it's God's plan from the beginning. The redemptive plan. All through the Old Testament. We just went through the first five books in the last couple of years or year and three quarter, whatever it is, two years. 
We just went through the first five books of the Old Testament and all the, 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 um, the sacrifices and everything that pointed towards Jesus Christ. And those of you who came on Wednesday night, you couldn't believe how interesting numbers was, could you? All the things that God was pointing to that we've read so many times and we missed them every time. I was telling Pastor Scott this morning that, you know, I don't know how many times I've read through Matthew and, and, and Luke, and, and it never really clicked in my head about the marriage and how it, they would wait a year. And then, uh, you know, the, the, the groom would come in with his friends and they'd blow the trumpet and, and the women would have the, uh, the lamps that were full of oil. And the, and the groom would take the, his bride and take her back home and they would be there for seven days and nobody would see him. Sound familiar? Seven years. Seven years of the tribulation after what? The church leaves. Are you kidding me? Lord, how did I miss that all those times? But see, that's what God's pointing to. Now he has a genealogy. You know, when you're reading the genealogy and you're thinking to yourself, why is this in here? You know, I used to think, well, God just wants to torture me. You know, he, he wants me to stay here and read these things, these names that I can't pronounce, right? Because you can't pronounce half of them. But it's kind of interesting because if you really look into them, you really study them, they have a meaning, meaning. And if you remember, if you were here a couple of weeks ago or listened to it on YouTube, uh, Mike gave a great... Uh, um, message on genealogies and what they meant and what these names meant and how the, uh, from, from Adam to, uh, to Noah told, told what? Of salvation. And here you have it again and you, you look at this and you see here's this guy named Joseph. What does he mean to me? He doesn't mean nothing. He's the son of David. So he's the lineage of the king. Well, so is Mary as you look in, in Luke uh, uh, in, in Luke, in the genealogies of Luke. Oh yeah, and they went through this stuff and she got pregnant. She was supposed to be a virgin, but maybe she lied. I don't know. You know, but he, she goes and sees her friend and, and, her, and her friend's baby leaps in her womb. Is this all coincidence? It's just, just this is just happenstance, right? This, you know, uh, it, it just evolved this way, Right? Right? There, was a, there was a big bang, and then all of a sudden, all these people started lining up, and, 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 and it's unbelievable. But you look at how many prophecies that Jesus fulfilled when he came, over 300 prophecies. Just three of them is a number that we can't even comprehend in our minds, that no one can not even the computers that we have today, let alone all of them that he fulfilled. And this is the point Matthew makes. It's fulfilled, it's fulfilled, it's fulfilled. And he's going to say it some 33 times. It's fulfilled. But see, is it happenstance? This virgin gets pregnant? Joseph is sitting there, what am I going to do with her? An angel comes. Is it coincidence? Now, you can just take this here and make a great case, can't you? Just a little we know of what we've read here in the genealogies and here in the birth. But see, we don't need that, do we? Because we walk by faith, don't we? But the proof is here. But we don't need the proof. But we need to understand the proof. Why God went through all this trouble to get to this point because of what? The people that are sitting in this room. You. He went through all this trouble. He lined it all up for you so that there would be no question. I believe, and I can use this, and I can say to somebody, why did Israel keep all the genealogies? Why? Why did Herod try to destroy them? 
which we're going to talk about next week. Why? Why in 70 AD when Titus came and, and burnt the temple to, the, to a crisp, all the genealogies were there. It can never be proven again. This can never happen through these genealogies, let alone the fact that all these people are saying there's this virgin that gets pregnant and bears a son, the Holy One, the Holy Thing. That you had a man named Joseph who was a stand-up guy that was going to protect his wife. Every right to put her away based on the law. But he chose not to. <clears throat> Don't be afraid. Which he's conceived is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Telling, this is the angel telling Joseph, call his name what? It's always the father, and in this case, the stepfather, to give the name, Jesus. For he, who? Jesus, will save his people from their sins. You know, it's interesting because Joseph wanted to put his wife away quietly to cover up her what? Her sin. Because that's what he believed at the time, right? He wanted to put her away and cover up the sin. But his Lord and Savior, Jesus, his son, his stepson, is going to do the same thing, isn't he? He will save his people from their sins. He will take on sin. Interesting. Interesting. You know, one other thing, I, 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 um, you know, I, I know who I am. Uh, I see this guy in the mirror every day. And I struggle with things just like everybody else does. We struggle together, don't we? But I always think, you know, maybe I didn't study hard enough or maybe the Lord's going to, you know, not bless this message. And, and I always have in this back of my mind, that, you know, well, why are you asking the Lord to bless me so that I could give the message? I just want the Holy Spirit to go out so that you could hear the message through him, Okay. I just happen to be the donkey that stands up here. You know, as, as the scripture says that, uh, you know, the, the, um, the, the simple are the ones that God uses. The foolish are the ones that God uses. Well, the biggest fool stands right up here. Otherwise, I wouldn't be up here. So I know I'm the biggest fool, right? So I always think, Lord, you know, I, I hope I don't fall flat on my face, almost like in a sense that uh, the Lord would humiliate me or, or make me feel stupid or embarrass me. But that never happens because that's not what God wants. And if you look at Mary here, Joseph did not want to put his wife away. He didn't want to embarrass her. He didn't want to make her look stupid. He loved her, didn't he? He cared for her. And he's got to be leaping for joy in his heart because now this angel came and said, she's telling the truth. Yeah, it might not look that way, but she's telling the truth. But see, as Jesus will do, he will save his people from their sins, which he's already done. But this is what Matthew is telling here in this gospel. And it says, so all of this was done. Why? Finish it. All of this was done that it might be fulfilled. What fulfilled? From the beginning, the seed of the woman. Genesis chapter 3, the seed of the woman. Women don't have seeds. Or do you? You don't. All this was done 
that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by who? The Lord. Through who? The prophet. Anybody know who this prophet is? Isaiah. This is, he's going to quote Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. It says, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Now, do you remember when Abraham went to take his son? to sacrifice him, his only son. Do you remember that? Do you remember that story? Here he is taken. Now, it's kind of interesting because, you know, a lot of the kid stuff will show Abraham as a normal guy, and you have this little kid, you know, maybe like 12 years old. Well, Isaac was probably 30. He could have overpowered his 120-year-old dad, 130-year-old dad, could have overpowered him easily, but he went willingly, willingly, got put on o- over the, the fire that he was going to build. His dad was going to kill him and spill his blood. But what happened? God intervened. And God said to him that I will provide what? Myself as a sacrifice. Here it is. Here it is provide myself. God is to be the sacrifice. And see through, as we look at Matthew, and that's what he's trying to say, look, this is, God has told you what was going to happen. Were you listening? Well, yeah, they were listening up to the point where they found out that it was Jesus because he didn't bow down. He didn't, he didn't bow down to the, to the leaders of the church, to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He didn't bow down to them did he? He cared about the people. He cared about, and he cared about them as well, but they didn't want to have nothing to do with them. So now everything changes. Oh, well, this can't be the guy. He's, you know, he's going to come and he's going to throw Rome out of the country and we're going to rule. Israel's going to rule. Like in the days of Solomon or King David. But no, But see, they missed the parts that said that he was going to come as a servant and that he was going to suffer and die because of sin so that he could restore back to the Father what was rightly the Father's, us, our Creator. So it says... She shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took to him his wife, and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he was... he called his name Jesus. Now, this is kind of interesting, and, and... typical of God. What did he say here? And he did not, what? Know her. He didn't know her intimately. He didn't touch her. Until she had brought forth her firstborn son. Now, a lot of people, not a lot, but some people, I don't know where they get this stuff from, but uh, say, well, you know, she, Mary really wasn't a virgin because, you know, she was married to Joseph. Or they'll say Mary is still a virgin, a perpetual virgin. Well, that's discounted when uh, his brothers and, are named off by name and told that he, he had sisters. How many is that? That's at least two. So you add them up, there's nine people in the house. Jesus and six others. Doesn't sound like a virgin to me. Not anymore. But see, what God really wants to point out here is what? And did not know her till. So she still was a virgin until Jesus was born. Now, why is that important? Why is that important? Because 
Jesus had to be sin free. If he was going to get it, how could a sinner die for another sinner and take their sins away? You can't. But Jesus did because he was what? Sin free. So here this Jesus came and walked among us, didn't he? Became flesh right here. And he walked among us. Why? Why did he do this? Why did he walk among us? Why was it so important? So that we could, he could understand, although he knew, but he could use an example of himself, how it is to walk by faith. So how it is to have the desire in your heart, not in your mind, but in your heart, to do what is right. We're all going to fail. None of us are perfect. We're all going to be tempted. We're all going to stumble. But the example that he gave us is what? Himself. He didn't. What did he do when he gets tempted? We're, which we're going to read maybe in a month from now. I don't know. Maybe less. What did he do? He went to the word of God. He spoke the word of God. Even though Satan was taking the word of God and twisting it around, eh, oh, let's tweak it here and there. Because if he had came right out and said it, and that's what he does with us, doesn't he? Takes a little bit, oh yeah, it's okay. Oh, you know what? <clears throat> it's okay to lie. You know, if, it, if the other person's feelings are gonna get hurt, by you telling the truth, it, it, it's okay to lie. Just, it's just a little white lie, and it's for their benefit, right? Is that true? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Now, sometimes you get put into positions like that, and you've got to use a lot of tact and a lot of thought, but you can't lie. I know when I get in stuff like that, I just start praying, Lord, pff, whatever I say, you tell me what to say, and, you know, may I say it in love. And sometimes it's hard to do, isn't it? But, see, he came to walk among us to show us that the right thing to do would be to tell the truth. Why? And you know what that truth does? It sets you free. You know why? Because you don't have to remember all the lies you told getting to that point. Oh, yeah, I used to do this and this and this and this. I forgot. Yeah, maybe I did that and that and those things. And... But see, he showed us how to walk, how to live, how to honor God, how to pray, how to love. And he equips us to do all of those things, doesn't he? Sometimes we might not think that way, but he does. He tells us to serve him, right? How do we do that? By serving each other, right? So as we <coughs> look at this birth, the evidence is there. The evidence is there. This was written a couple of th almost a couple of thousand years ago. It stood the test of time. If it was false, the apostles who were there would have said, hey, wait a minute, that's wrong. That can't be. That was not true. You know, Luke was a physician. He is saying the same thing. He was precise in what he did. Matthew, he was a tax collector. He was exact on what he said. There's nothing in here that's not true. Here it is. Here's the genealogy. Here's the birth. This is the Messiah. He is there. He's the one that saved you from your sins. And as he continues on, he's going to tell you how he did it and the things he did. Not all of them, you know, because it says that the books in the entire world cannot contain the things that Jesus did. So here you are, sitting here in the year 2021, September 12th, I think, yes, and here we are learning about something that happened a couple of thousand years ago. Why? To strengthen your faith so that you may not be afraid, so that you may trust in him, so that you may know, even though you know in your heart, because what? We're saved by grace through faith, right? But the evidence is here. 
can we use this? Absolutely. Here, let me give you some, let me try to witness to you and I'll give you some genealogies. They ain't going to work. Well, it might. If they were Jewish, it probably would. Because they lost their genealogies. But here you are. And, and here, Jesus, what God had to go through to get Jesus on in the flesh on this earth Is it coincidence? Does it strengthen your faith? Then God succeeded this morning, didn't he? Hey, I can bank on this, but my faith is stronger than the words, than the evidence. Amen? So, when I'm done today, which will be in just a few seconds, Come on up here for prayer. Don't be afraid. Do not be afraid. The Lord is with you always. And when you walk up here to get prayer, he'll be with you. He really will. He won't leave you nor forsake you. Maybe you have a lot of things going on this coming week and you're dreading them. Oh, I dread Monday. I got to go to work. I dread Tuesday even worse because I got to work. That's two days in a row. What am I going to do? Lord, get me out of this. But see, our jobs are what? Working for the Lord, isn't it? You might be a nurse. You might be a doctor. You might be an airline mechanic. You might be retired. You might be a secretary, although I don't think they call that anyone anymore. I don't know what it is, something assistant. I don't know. You might be a homemaker. But that's how the Lord provides. Your job is working for him. So that job doesn't look so bad on Monday now that I say that. Because there might be an opportunity. Right? Isn't that what we're here for? Wearing his hands and feet to put our arm around somebody when they're hurting to love on one another, to pray with them. So if you stand, we'll pray. But don't run away. If you need prayer, come on up. You'll need some guys up here and their wives, and, and they just live to pray with you. They really do. They wake up on Sunday morning going, man, I hope somebody comes up. because I, I hope three people come up because I just want to pray with somebody. Isn't that right, guys? Yeah. No? Okay. <laughs> well, let's pray. Father, <clears throat> we thank you for your word. We know you've overheard what we've said here today. You've been in the midst of us. You've sent your Holy Spirit. And you hear what we say. You hear the thoughts of our heart as we heard your words. And maybe the things were, maybe our shortcomings, Lord, and and you pointed them out to us. Or, or maybe today we're lacking a little bit of faith because we're going through some struggles. And, but we know you're there. You, you tell us not to be afraid. And, and, and the greatest thing is that you tell us 365 times, go figure, to not be afraid in your word. So, Lord, we're not going to be afraid. We're going to trust you. We're going to put our faith in you. We're going to live for you. We're going to honor you in the things we do so that you may be glorified, Lord. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you, you've given us this grace, your mercy that's new every morning, the love you've put in our hearts. We thank you how you use us. And, and Lord, if there's any of us sitting here today who doesn't know you or is not sure, Lord, may you open their eyes. May they see that it was by your death they're saved, that they don't have to do anything. They don't have to be good. They don't have to get their act together before they come to you. But they would open up their hearts to you and they would accept that free gift. And we as the church 
if there's something in our life that's causing friction between you and us. Maybe we've stumbled and fell and we're not repentive. Maybe we, maybe we just want to hang on to that for a little longer. Maybe it's just the normal things of the world that are coming against us and the, the spiritual attacks and we cave in and we feel so bad. But we know that you're right there to forgive us, that you've already forgiven us before we ever ask. And may we do so. May we stand here right now and say, Lord, forgive me for the things that I do against you, for my disobedience. But Father, I ask that you bless each and every one of us here from the top of their head to the bottom of their foot that whatever their hand touches, you may be glorified. Father, we can't wait to go home to be with you, but until then, we're going to continue to occupy and be your hands and feet. And we ask these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And all his children said,